You guys want to do this tattoo drawing right now? Let's do this. All right. So all your cards, if you entered a card, are in here. And I am going to, I'll draw one card for a tattoo, and then maybe we'll draw another one. Somebody gets a free hug. I'm not hugging any of you. Come on. Ready? Here it is. This is the winning card. Tony, Henry, where are you? You just won. I feel like, I feel like I'm on the Price is Right. Come on down. Where are you? Oh, there she is. Congratulations. Let's hear it for Tony. So here's the deal. We're going to, um, you win. That, there, all the information is on that. So we're going to um, draw another one this week. So you still have a chance. We're going to give out one more this week. And we'll be drawing that at some point. But you can't win again, Tony. All right. So the, uh, the Chronicles of Narnia are a series of seven books that this guy, C.S. Lewis, wrote. And one of the ideas that C.S. Lewis entertains in this series of books is that there could be other worlds, other places, other dimensions, and uh, these other places could be like right next door to us, but we wouldn't know it because it's another dimension. And uh, it could even all be connected, what's happening there, to, to what's happening here. And he, he supposes that if those other places actually existed, well, then God would need to come to them just like he came to us. And so God would come to them just like he came to earth for us. Narnia is one such place. It's this magical world in another dimension, and it's largely populated by animals. And so there's like talking horses and cows and dogs, and it's got unicorns and giants and elves, and, and God does come to Narnia, just like he came to earth, but very appropriately, God comes to Narnia as a huge, ferocious lion named Aslan. And this whole series of books is about these children who go back and forth from Earth to Narnia and, and have all kinds of adventures, and they meet this lion, Aslan, who represents God from time to time. But one of the books in this series is called The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. In this book, The Dawn Treader, uh, there's this one boy who's just a real creep. I mean, he is a selfish little creep uh, whose name is Eustace. Actually, I believe the book begins with the line, Once upon a time, there lived a boy named Eustace Clarence Scrub, and he partly deserved it. <laughs> and he does. Uh, from page one, he is just aggravating. I mean, he goes into Narnia kicking and screaming because he does not want to be there. and He always has to have his own way. He's only thinking of himself all the time. Uh, they, they have a water shortage and so they have to ration out the water. And uh, every time Eustace gets his own water and someone else's water. And, and whenever uh, food is being rationed, he gets his own food and he ends up getting somebody else's food also. And, and he's always angry with everyone because he can't understand why they don't understand why he needs more than everyone else needs. So uh, these kids are going on this trip on a voyage on a ship called the Dawn Treader. And they get into this big storm and the mast of their boat gets broken. And, and so they have to stop at this island to repair the boat. And they get to the island and use this little selfish, lazy guy that he is, realizes that there's going to be work that needs to be done to set up camp and fix the boat. And so wanting to avoid that work, he, he kind of slips off into the forest. Well, soon everyone starts calling for him to come and help with the work, and he can hear them. And the fact that he can hear them makes him think maybe they can find him. So he just wanders deeper into the forest to make sure that he's not found. And eventually, he gets lost. Well, just about the time uh, the sun starts going down and, and it starts getting kind of cold and he decides that he just needs to find a place to sleep in the forest for the night. And so he starts looking around and he finds this dragon's lair. And outside of the dragon's lair is this dead dragon, which gives him the idea that the, the dragon's lair is probably empty. And sure enough, it is. And so he decides that he'll just spend the night in the dragon slayer, and, and he starts crawling back into it. And right before he goes to sleep, he finds this, this gold bracelet, uh, this beautiful little gold bracelet that's sitting on the ground. And so he puts the bracelet on his wrist, and he goes to sleep. 
Well, midway through the night, he wakes up because the bracelet is just hurting his arm really bad. And so he decides to take it off, but for some reason, he cannot get it off of his arm, and, and he's just feeling kind of weird. And so he starts kind of thrashing around, and he, he makes his way finally out of the cave. And when he does, and he can see himself in the moonlight, he realizes that something horrible has happened. He has turned himself into a dragon. Evidently, there's some kind of magic in that bracelet, and it has turned him to, into this scaly old dragon, and the bracelet will not come off. He tries, and he tries, and he tries, but the bracelet can't come off. He can't do it. So uh, this little boy, Eustace, has now gotten himself trapped inside this horrible dragon. It is a bad situation, and he's very upset, and he doesn't know what to do. The only advantage he has is that dragons have wings, and so he's now able to fly. And, and so he flies around until finally he finds his friends on the beach, and he, he flies over to them, and they're afraid. They start screaming, it's a dragon! It's a dragon! But after a while, he's able to communicate with them, and they figure out, that's Eustace. Somehow, Eustace got himself turned into a dragon. That's horrible. No one can get close to him because when he cries, it's big, hot, steamy tears, and you can get scalded by him, and you just have to stay away from him. And, and sometimes he'll just breathe out a spurt of fire that, that could burn the other kids real bad, and so they can barely spend any time near him. And they all take turns trying to get the bracelet off his wrist, but they can't either. No one can get it off. And night after night, every night when the sun goes down, uh, Eustace knows that it's getting closer and closer to the time when he's going to be separated from everyone else forever. Because uh, the boat is almost ready to go and they're going to continue on in their voyage. They can't stay there and he cannot go with them the way that he is. And as it is, he has to sleep way off on the other side of the beach from all the other kids because he stays. Stinks. It turns out dragons smell bad. One night, the night uh, the boat was finally fixed, the night before the morning when they were going to leave on their journey and have to leave Eustace behind forever, that night uh, Eustace was laying down on his end of the beach, and in the middle of the night he was awakened. And, and he looks, and standing over by the edge of the forest is this big golden lion. And the lion kind of indicates that he wants Eustace to follow him. And so Eustace does. He follows him into the forest. And they start kind of weaving their way through the forest until finally they come to this clearing in the middle. And there's this uh, crystal clear pool of water in the middle of the forest. The, the lion walks up to Eustace and he says, Would you like to be a boy again? And Eustace says, more than anything. And the lion says, okay, well then, get in the water. Eustace starts to get in the water, but the lion says, you, you can't get in like that. And Eustace asks, what? And the lion, Aslan, he says, you've got to take your skin off first. Well, Eustace thinks, how, how do I do that? How can I take my skin off? But then he remembers that he's a dragon, and dragons are reptiles, and reptiles shed their skin. And so he takes one of his claws, and he draws a line down his chest, and he just rips off a layer of dragon skin, and he throws it to the ground, and he looks at himself, and he realizes that it was only one layer. He's still a dragon. The lion says, you'll have to go deeper than that. And so he draws another line down his chest and he digs in his claws and he rips off another layer of skin. He throws it down, he looks, and he's still a dragon. And so the lion says, You'll have to go a lot deeper than that. You'll have to let me do it. And the lion comes over to Eustace, and he grabs him, and he lays him back, and he pulls out his enormous lion claws, and he sinks them into Eustace's chest, and he begins to rip away. He goes much deeper than Eustace ever would have gone, and just tears off layer after layer after layer of dragon skin. And then finally, he grabs a hold of Eustace, and he plunges him into the water, and it stings like nothing has ever stung before, but it is 
exhilarating in a way that nothing has ever been before. And when he pulls Eustace out of the water, Eustace looks down at his reflection and he realizes that he's a boy again. He's what he was always intended to be. Today we're concluding uh, our series called Tattooed. And in this series, we've been talking about our identity, uh, what we think of ourselves. And we've learned that our self-identity drives our behavior. We, we've said what you do is determined by what you think of you. You don't make your decisions the way you think you make your decisions. What you do is determined by what you think of you. And we've learned that what you do, your self-identity, is largely based on the messages that you've received in life. So if you had uh, a, a parent who always told you that you were a failure or if the bullies at school made you feel like you didn't fit in and could never really, uh, you know, be a part of things because you were weird or if you had a, a grandparents or an influential coach who made you feel that you had to be successful to be important, well, those messages have a way of, of coming in and shaping what we think about ourselves even though those messages may very well be lies. And so we start to believe lies about ourselves. A couple of weeks ago, I asked you to, to write down some of the lies that you've come to believe about yourself. And, and you can see that somebody wrote, I am unlovable. Someone wrote, um, no one will love you if you're fat. Uh, I can't do it. I'm not worthy. Uh, drinking heals my pain, I'm too clingy and not good enough. It, we, we start to believe these lies, and, um, and they start to shape and mold who we become. But one thing we haven't said much about in this series is that our sin also affects how we view ourselves. Our sin also affects who we become. I mean, We've all done things, right? Th things that we're not proud of. And, and those things have contributed to the mess that we've become. If these boards reflect how our past is having an effect on our present, so far what we've put on that board are, are the lies that we've come to believe about ourselves. And so in a very real sense, those are the, the ways that we've been sinned against by other people who made us feel that way. But we've sinned as well. And the sins of our past also affect our present. Like Clarence used to scrub, sometimes it's our decisions that are a part of what turns us into someone we never wanted to be. And so we could add to the ugliness of these boards, we, we could add our own sin, right? Like in addition to the way we've been sinned against, the lies that we've come to believe, we could write, I don't know if you can see it very well, but, but we could write sin because we've contributed to the mess that we are. And so the question we ask today is, what do we do? What do we do about this? Well, that's part of the problem. Part of the issue is that, that we, we, we can't do much of anything. We're, we're just too much of a mess to clean ourselves up. We've been saying that we need to remove the old tattoos, the old identity, and we need to be tattooed with our true identity, with our new identity. And our true identity is that we are loved by God. We were made in the image of God, and we were made for relationship with God. We are God's kids. Uh, here's one way that the Bible puts it. Uh, we're going to put all the Bible verses on the screen today so you can read them up there. But 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. That's what we are. We are the ones Jesus loves. And we need to have that identity restored to us, our original identity, which has always been our true identity. The problem is I, I just don't think we're capable of doing that on our own. I mean, th that's part of the reason people struggle to make lasting changes. We've all made changes, and, and then we go back to doing the same old things. It's because we can't do it. We don't go deep enough. We're going to have to go a lot deeper than that. We're going to have to let God do it. 
Think of it this way. Uh, let's say that uh, this afternoon you go up in your attic. And, and let's say that you haven't seen your attic in years. Like when you moved into the house, you had a couple boxes you knew you'd never use. And so you opened up the attic and kind of shoved them in there. But you have not seen that attic since. Okay? But for some reason this afternoon you're up in the attic and you look in the corner and you see there's something. It looks kind of like a canvas or something. And so you go over and look at it and you realize this isn't mine. Like I, when I showed up at this house, I didn't have this with me. It, it must have been left by some previous owner. And, and so you look at it and you realize it's a painting. It, it's like a really old painting. And, and upon inspection, you, you start to think, I'm pretty sure that this is like a, a masterpiece fame, painted by a famous artist. But there's a problem. The, the problem is that there's mud splotched all over the painting. You can see the painting, but more you can see the mud. And so you, you take it out of, its ad, out of the attic and, and you do some, some research and you discover that this is a masterpiece. It was painted by a famous artist and it is worth millions of dollars. You've just discovered a painting worth millions of dollars. Question, would you focus on the mud? Would you just eh, throw the painting out because it's got mud on it? <laughs> no, you wouldn't. No, no. You would focus on the masterpiece. You have a painting worth millions of dollars, and your goal would be, man, I need to get rid of the mud and restore this painting to its original condition so I can reveal the masterpiece, right? So, so it can be obvious how much this painting is really worth because with all the mud, it's hard to tell. And you probably would think, maybe I should just do it myself. But, but then you'd be smart enough to realize if I take a bottle of Windex and a sponge and start, you know, rubbing the mud off, I'm going to ruin the painting too. And I'll destroy the whole thing. And, and so you realize I can't do it. And what you would do is you would find and bring the painting to a expert who, who knows how to remove the mud without destroying the painting, who knows how to restore a painting to its original condition. So listen, God has made you a masterpiece. You are a masterpiece. Now, you've gotten some mud on you. you. You know that. Some of it has been thrown on you by other people, right? People have sinned against you. People have, have told you lies about yourself and, and got you to believe those lies. And, and then some of the mud you've caked on yourself, We've all sinned, and, and we've added messiness to what was already marring our original identity. You're, you're messy. I'm, I'm messy. But that doesn't change your value. That doesn't change the masterpiece that is you. It just means that you need to have the mud removed so that you can reveal the, the actual, the real masterpiece of who you are. But, but that's not something you can do. And so you're going to need to bring yourself to God because he's the only one who can remove the mud and restore you to your original condition. You need to trust him. You need to trust him, even though that may not be what you want to do. That is not the natural thing to do, right? The, the natural thing to do, if you realize, I do have some problems. I, I, I believe lies. I've sinned. I've messed up my life. My life is very messy. The natural thing is to try to fix it yourself, right? To be like, I got this. Give me some time. It might take me a little bit, but I got this. I can do this on my own. Kind of like Clarence, you used as Clarence Scrub. We, we, we start peeling off the layers of mud of our false identity, the lies that we've believed, and, and of our sin, the, the problems that we've created for ourselves. We, we start peeling off the layers, but all we find is more layers. There's more layers, and so we're going to have to go deeper than that. We're going to have to go much deeper than that. In fact, we're going to need to let God do it because only he can restore you to your original condition and help to reveal the masterpiece that you are and have always been. You have to trust him. And good news, you can trust him. See, sometimes our problem, we've talked about this for four weeks, is our self-identity. Sometimes our problem is how we see ourselves. But another problem that a lot of us have is how we see God. The identity we've put on him. A lot of us uh, get our picture from God from some 
really mean, ornery priest or pastor we had growing up, and it just gave us this idea that God is kind of a mean ogre himself. And, or some of us find in the Bible that God is referred to as a father, and so we put the, the image of our earthly dads on God, and it's like, uh-uh, no thanks. No thank you. But God is not like your earthly father or the mean priest or pastor you had. In God, you have a perfect father. Here's how the Bible describes God. In the book of 1 John uh, chapter 4, verse 8, it says, God is love. That's who God is. God is love. God is love, and God loves you with a perfect love. He loves you like no one has ever loved you before or ever will love you. His love is perfect, and that means that it's not based on your performance. That means you could never make God love you any more than he does right now or any less. And that changes everything, right? When, when you get that, you realize that means I don't have to perform. I don't have to earn anything from God. And, and I don't have to be afraid of failing because I can't lose his love. That's why the Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, God's perfect love drives out all our fear. It's like there's no reason to fear anymore because of God's perfect love. We have a God who loves us perfectly, and you can't lose his love. That's why the Bible stresses so emphatically that God first accepted us when we were at our very worst. God loves you with the perfect love, and he cares for you perfectly. He understands you. You might think he doesn't, but he does. He understands what it's like to be you because in Jesus, he came down to earth and he lived a human life. He was tempted in the same way you were. And so he understands our weaknesses and, and the, our temptations. And he is there for you. He is there for you. And his hands are strong enough. He will not drop you. He, he is not going to forget you. He is never going to let you down. You can trust God, and you need to trust him because you can't do it on your own. You just can't. You'll, you'll never go deep enough. You're going to have to let God do it. Only God can go deep enough to remove the mess and restore us to who we're really supposed to be. So the question, I think, becomes how? How do you let God do it? How, how, do, you, how do you do that? And the answer is we, we give our lives to him, just like we would give that painting to the expert and say, here, do, do, do what you do. <laughs> like, make this painting right. It's worth a lot. We give our lives to God. We've said in this series, and we've said today, we can't do it. We've talked in this series about strongholds, that, that we need divine power to demolish, that going at him with a fly swatter doesn't work. We need a sledgehammer, right? And we've said that there are lies that we need God's truth to, to, to be freed from. There are sins that we need God's forgiveness from. We need God, but God will never force himself on you. If you're just kind of thinking, yeah, I'm like, that's why I'm here. I'm, I'm waiting for God to do something. God's never going to force himself on you. God will come into your life, and he will work in your life, and he will restore you. He'll bring healing, but only if he's invited. And so you need to give your life to him. The Bible tells us that, that God wants us to give all of ourselves to him. And so it, it's kind of cool. God's provided different ways to give different parts of who we are to him. And so th this is how we give our, ourselves to God. Uh, the Bible says that we give ourselves mentally, because that's part of who we are. We have this intellectual side, right? We, we give ourselves mentally God, to God by placing our faith in his son, Jesus, and the death he died on the cross for us. The Bible calls Jesus' death and atoning sacrifice. The word atone literally means to erase. Like if you erase something, you know, you wrote in pencil. And so the idea is that through Jesus' death, if we put our faith in it, it erases all the messiness that, that have gunked up our lives. And so faith is this mental decision where we say, I can't do it. I, I don't have it. I, I've messed up my life. I've turned myself in, into a dragon, into something I never intended to become. I need Jesus. I, I, I can't go deep enough on my own, so I am turning to Jesus and putting my faith in his ability to save me and make me right in, in the, the atoning sacrifice, the, the death that he died on a cross. We, we give ourselves to God mentally through faith. 
And then the Bible says that we give ourselves to God verbally through confession. Not, not a confession where you go and you sit you know, next to some priest in a little booth. and, and not, not that. Uh, the Bible's talking about admitting to God and, and to yourself and, and maybe to other people if, if they ask that, that our lives have become too messy. That, that we, we've screwed up too much to fix it ourselves. And so we, we recognize our need for a Savior. And we need to be saved from our lies, and from the lies that we've believed, and from ourselves, and from our sin by Jesus. And, and then the Bible says that we give ourselves physically, because that's another part of who we are, right? We have this physical body, to God through baptism. Baptism is when a person's lowered underwater and then raised up out of water. In that C.S. Lewis story, the lion represents Jesus. And just as Clarence, uh, used as Clarence Scrub, was willing to have this lion plunge him into the water and then uh, to, to make him clean again, we surrender physically to God through baptism. Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, he said, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. And the symbolism of baptism, uh, of a person being in, immersed in water, is so great. It's so beautiful. In, in baptism, we're buried in water as Jesus was buried in a grave when he died. And so for us, it symbolizes a death to our old self, to all the lies we believe, to the, to the self-identity that has plagued us for so long. We die to all that, and then we're raised up out of the water, just as Jesus was raised out of the grave when he was resurrected. And, and it's this idea that we have a new life that we now get to live with God because we've been restored to our original identity. The, the layers of messiness have been taken off and now we are who we were always supposed to be. So uh, we are not the kind of church that pressures people into making decisions. If you've been coming for any amount of time, you, you figure that out. Today is no different. Uh, perhaps some of you are so new to this uh, I, I know we had a you know, guy last week hadn't been to church in 40 years. Maybe, maybe some of you are so new to this that you're not ready to make this kind of decision. And if you're not ready yet, here's what I pray. I pray that you, you will very intentionally move forward towards making this decision. Like, like this is way too important to just put on the back burner and think maybe someday. That, that's crazy talk. Like, like, I hope that you'll decide this has got to become the, the number one priority is figuring this out so I can know if I can make this decision. But, but, but here's what I believe. I believe that many of you probably are ready. And, and I'm talking about the people who have never given their lives to God. Maybe you believe in God. Maybe you believe in Jesus. Maybe you grew up going to church. Maybe you've been coming here for a while. But you've never really given your life to God. You've never been baptized. I bet most of you are ready today. Listen, you don't have to know everything about the Bible. You don't have to have gone to church a certain amount of time. In fact, here's something interesting. There are thousands of examples of people in the Bible who say yes, give their, put their faith in Jesus, confess, get baptized. And of the thousands of examples, all except for one, are people who that was the very first day they ever heard about Jesus. Literally, they woke up that morning, didn't know who Jesus was. At some point during their day, they hear about Jesus, and that day say, I, I need that. I know I'm a mess. I, I need someone to save me. And so they say yes, and they get baptized that same day. You don't, you don't have to know everything. But you do, you do have to know this. You need to agree with this. And so I would ask you, do, do you know this? Do you agree with this? You, you need to know, I know I've messed up. I know my, my whole life I've been going down my own path. I recognize that Jesus is the Son of God and that he came and he died for me because I'm the one Jesus loves. I, I, I know that he can take away my mess and re remove the, the mud and he can make me clean. I know that I want a relationship with him and I, I want to spend the rest of my life in a relationship with him. I want him to lead me down his path for the rest of my life. If you know those things, if you agree with those things, then you are ready to give your life to God. There's a verse in the Bible that says, and now, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. I bet God would say that to some of you today. I bet if God could have a private conversation with you, he would say, and now, what are you waiting for? Get up, 
Be baptized and wash your sins away, calling on his name. So we're, we're doing baptisms two weeks from today. Uh, we'll be doing them after services, and, and um, we're, we're, th- we have two weeks so that you have a chance to invite your friends and family so that they could be here and, and uh, share that moment with you if you'd like. But, but there's another verse in the Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. It says, today is the day of salvation. Today. And so the idea is like, like God's offering to save you today. Why would you say no to that? Right? Don't put that off. You do that today. Today is the day to say yes to that offer. Today is the day of salvation. So in a, in a couple minutes, I'm going to pray. And I'm going to kind of, in that prayer, I'm going to re-invite God into my life and, and give my life to God again. And if you want to do this today, if you're like, I need this, I'm ready, then, uh, then you can make that prayer your own. You know, you, you can say this prayer, say yes to God, and, and say, today, God, I'm giving my life to you. Are you ready to do that? Are you ready to invite God into your life so that you can start living your life, experiencing his love, and so that you can start learning his truth so that it can overwhelm the lies that you've believed for so long and, and have all your sins removed by Jesus and the atoning death he died for you on the cross? Are you ready? Are you ready to have it all taken away so that you can have your original identity, the masterpiece, restored? That's what God wants to do. If you just say yes and give your life to him. Here's here's what God wants to do. Let me give you a picture of this. That's what he wants to do in your life, right? Remove all the messiness, all the lies that we've been told and come to believe, all our sin, and restore to us our true identity, our original identity, which is the one Jesus loves. You're the one Jesus loves. So if you want God to do that in your life, uh, would you pray this prayer with me? Let's pray. God, 
God, I, I, um, I have been sinned against. Uh, I've talked in this series about my dad, but I've had so many people who have made me feel less than and not good enough, and I've, I've come to believe those lies about myself, and, um, and that is not who you made me to be, and I don't want to believe those lies and have that identity anymore. God, the, the truth is I have also sinned. I've sinned more times than uh, I would like to admit or, or could remember or could imagine. You love me, but every time I sin, I'm going against your, your love, your plan for me, against the relationship that you want to have with me. And so I'm a mess, and it's not just other people's fault. It's my fault too. But God, I, I understand that no matter how much I've sinned, no matter what I've done, you still love me. I don't know, I don't know if I can understand why, but you still love me, and you still see me for who I really am. I'm the one you love. I'm the one Jesus loves. And you still love me so much, you came and you died for me. And so God, right now, maybe in a way I've never had before, I want to give my life to you. I, I accept Jesus as my Savior and that his death is the only thing that could erase those lies and erase my sin and make me right again, make me who I always was supposed to be. God, I can't do it. I've tried. And so I'm coming to you. God, I'm giving my life to you. I'm asking you to remove my sin. God, I, I'm, I'm deciding that I, I would like to get baptized as this beautiful picture of dying to all that and to being restored to a new life with you. I want to I want to have all of it washed away. God, I want to be in a relationship with you. I want to get to know you more and love you more, and I want to follow your leadership for the rest of my life. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for loving me so much you died for me. I give my life to you. I accept Jesus as my savior, my leader, the, the Lord of my life. And I pray in his name. If you, as we continue to, with our eyes closed, if you just said that prayer maybe for the first time, would you just raise your hand and say, that's me, just kind of indicate, I just, I just prayed that prayer, I, I want to do that. And God, God knows uh, that you're raising your hand, and, uh, and that's awesome. And, and God, we thank you for that, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, listen, if you just said that prayer, uh, that is so awesome, and congratulations. And here's what the Bible says about that. The Bible says that heaven explodes into a party when someone says yes and gives their life to God and invites him. Like, literally, there's a party in heaven. Not, not metaphorically, there's literally a party in heaven right now because you said yes to God. And if you said yes to, to God today, would, would you sign up for baptism uh, in two weeks at the Velcro Bar, which is our connecting place? There'll be people back there who can help you if you need. But um, on the iPads, there's a sign-up sheet that you can let us know, uh, hey, I'm thinking— I thinking I need to get baptized, and we'll give you a call, and we'll tell you all about it and answer any questions that you have. Also, maybe some of you are like, I, I kind of almost said the prayer, but I've got some questions. There's just some things I don't know. And so we're going to have several of the, the pastors in our church uh, available up here after the service. If you said the prayer and you're like, I want to tell somebody, come up and tell us. We would love to celebrate that with you. If you're like, I have questions, like I want to do it, but I just want, we'd love to answer your questions or pray for you, whatever we can do. So several of us will be up here. Um, we'd love to, love to talk to you. And if you, if you want to get baptized, if you've never been baptized, but your, your faith is in Jesus, um, you can do that sign up for that today at the Velcro Bar. Thank you so much for being here. I really hope that you enjoyed and got a lot out of this whole tattooed series. If you missed any of it, you can listen to it or watch it online at the Verve website or on the Verve app. Uh, next week, we're going to do something really special. I'm super excited. Don't miss it. Like next week is our new series called Wedgied, where we're going to, one of the pastors is going to on stage. No, that, that's not what we're doing next week. But next week is going to be awesome. It's a special kind of one-time thing you don't want to miss. And then the next week, we're starting a new series. But next week, we're doing something really cool. Uh, so be here next week. Until then, and as always, Viva La Verve.